for the recording to start. Great. Um, OK, so uh, again, hello everyone and welcome to Art in Conversation Extra Talks. Today we will talk about art as a challenging medium. Uh, while we may associate art with beauty, disgust and aesthetic of ugliness play also an important role in it. Uh, and how we, do we experience disgust when we engage uh, with artworks? Uh, and do negative emotions are, um, that we experience not different from negative emotions that we experience in everyday life? Are the two questions that we pose to our speakers today. As usual, so we invited two experts to discuss this topic from different point of view. Uh, I'd like to remind you uh, that first we will have the two talks and then we will have a discussion. During the discussion, everyone will have the chance to ask a question question or comment something, so please write down your questions. Uh, now I would like to introduce our first speaker today, who is Filippo Contesi, who is a researcher in philosophy at the University of Barcelona. Dr. Contesi is a cross-disciplinary philosopher currently working in the Logos Research Group in Analytic Philosophy. Uh, his research concerns various issues in empirically informed philosophy of effects, aesthetics and linguistics diversity in philosophy. He also engages in less conventional forms of academic action in the hope to making philosophy more open and transparent. Among these initiatives, I'd like to mention that between 2015 and 18, he co-organized the Aesthetics and Cognitive Science talks in Paris, and since 2020, he worked to make public, publicly accessible the webinars exploring issues related to the mind and the arts. Uh, Dr. Contesi, thank you very much for accepting our invitation, and please feel free to share your screen, and we look forward to your talk. Thank you. Thank you so very much, uh, Nicole uh, and, and Marina. For, Nicole for the kind introduction, Marina and Nicole for the invitation. I'm going to try and share the screen. How's this? Is this visible? Uh, yeah, we can see perhaps if you want to maximize the um, the window. The, yeah, like yes. that. Yeah, that's great. Perfect. Thank yeah. you. Thank you. OK, so uh, yeah, I'm really happy to to be um, speaking in this interdisciplinary uh, event. I think uh, um, we need many more of these, and, and this is a, a very virtuous example of collaboration in, in aesthetics between, uh, between different disciplines, in this case, philosophy and experimental psychology. So hopefully this will become um, more of a habit in the future. I also try and do some of it myself organizationally, but not with the firepower and, uh, and, uh, and the organizational prowess. Uh, that Nicole and Marina have. Okay, so so the question, yeah. So I've tried to address the uh, the questions uh, uh, that were given to me in the brief. Uh, I will talk a little bit more about ugliness uh, than about disgust, just because I've um, studied it. I studied disgust a bit more, um, but um, I will say some things about ugliness. And um, hopefully some of what I uh, will say about this guest will translate uh, to ugliness, to ugliness, sorry, um, without too much difficulty. Uh, okay, so let me try and see how I move this. Okay, perfect. So we're talking about mostly art and negative emotions uh, with a specific focus on disgust. I will briefly be arguing for a sort of pessimistic uh, view of disgust potential as a representational, as, a, as an emotion in, in art compared to other emotions. Uh, although I will uh, also be arguing that disgust can be made uh, compatible with uh, uh, great aesthetic pleasure or, or, or great artistic value. And I will give a uh, briefly uh, sketch a high order response account of how Disgust does this. So as Marina and Nicole uh, said in the in the in the written introduction to the to the session, uh, it's 
common and very uh, obvious to equate art with um, pleasure. After all, why, why would we go to the effort or uh, building art and, uh, if, if it wasn't um, for some uh, return? Obviously, it's, there's no immediate um, uh, function of art. And so the only uh, reason seems to be because it's, it's pleasurable. And of course, there's several sources of pleasure in art. Beauty is the paradigmatic one, it's one of them, but uh, it's by no means the only one. Uh, so there's uh, other sources of pleasure in art, uh, such as elegance, joy, uh, achievement, and also things that are uh, just positively valuable. So not just uh, positively emotional, but uh, more broadly positively valuable, justice and so on. Conversely, there's also a lot of sources of unpleasantness in art, and there's uh, and, and and this unpleasantness is very widespread um, in in art. And so the 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 problem is uh, if art uh, if art's function is to give us pleasure, then why do we also see so much unpleasantness? And of course, ugliness again, perhaps paradigmatic source of ugliness in art but then also negative emotions and uh, injustice and all of the uh, bad aspects, I guess, in a sense of the, of the sources of pleasure. Why do we enjoy uh, unpleasantness in art? The, the general uh, response, the types of responses that uh, philosophers have been giving throughout the, the centuries, uh, um, are too many to enumerate. But uh, my view, four are the most um, promising uh, kinds of uh, reasons why we uh, um, have unpleasantness in a lot of art. So one reason is it's uh, possible, sometimes it happens, to find pure pleasure boring. So if you have art that's just purely pleasurable, that can lead to boredom. So an admixture between the pleasant and the unpleasant can be more interesting or more pleasant. Two, uh, art often deals with features of the human condition. Uh, most often represents features of the human conditions and in, in general it deals with them. And, uh, and of course the human condition is uh, sometimes positive, sometimes negative. So unpleasantness is part of the human condition so far as uh, it is part of the human condition is uh, we expect it in art, we want to see it in, in art. Uh, third kinds of reason uh, is um, um, perhaps more uh, controversial, but there's a sense in which you can see um, the pleasure that you get from art or from or from anything else in, in life has the differential from a baseline, right? So, for, so Edmund Burke um, had some, some sort of an idea like this, right? So he thought that we were either, that most of the time we were in uh, boredom, right? So sort of in between states and that occasionally we would go uh, towards pain or pleasure, right? And, and then sometimes, um, a little pain would be good because it would lift us from boredom, right? So it would be uh, technically pain in, in absolute terms, pain, but relatively to boredom, it would be more um, pleasurable. So similarly, um, if you have, if you start from a lot of unpleasantness in, in say, uh, an artwork, in enjoying an artwork, uh, if you then uh, find something pleasurable in that artwork, then the differential between your state of unpleasantness and the state of uh, pleasure can be uh, can give us a phenomenologically greater pleasure than uh, than just the, the simple pleasure would be do, would be giving us in absolute terms. And then fourth um, um, is that sometimes negative emotions are you might call them uh, witness emotions. So in a sense, you um, 
negative emotions are to some extent more pleasurable to witness than to experience. Uh, and the, the reverse is true of uh, positive emotions by and large, right? So seeing a bunch of people in a movie being really, really happy uh, about their fictional lives, that might not uh, be uh, particularly pleasurable because it's, you know, they're not our lives, they're not even real life lives. Uh, but, um, uh, but yeah, negative emotions are uh, perhaps more prone to, in, paradoxically, than positive emotions to be represented in art. And of course, the caveat has always been in philosophy and, and sort of more recently, uh, also the empirical literature seems to be uh, agreeing with this, is that all of these pros of unpleasantness in art are possible provided that the emotion, the negative emotion that we experience in art or the negative emotional events that we see in art are not too overwhelming. They're not too intense, the, the unpleasantness not too much. Um, so one of the the, for the sort of initial uh, thoughts that one might have in, uh, um, so now I'm gonna, so this is a sort of a general uh, uh, picture. Now I'm going to go a bit more into uh, disgust. Um, so one of the initial ideas that one might have um, as to why do we like unpleasant things in art is to say, well, really, um, the emotions that we experience uh, at, at, you know, at the cinema or in art are not, uh, or in literature or whatever, they're not really emotions. They're a different kind of emotion. So they're not really unpleasant. Um, that's an, an, an option that people in philosophy have sometimes been attracted to. Sometimes, traditionally, it's been called uh, the, these different kind of emotions in art have been called aesthetic emotions often. More recently, uh, it was called by uh, a very influential philosopher called Kendall Walton. Uh, they were called quasi-emotions. The difference uh, was there, but it, it wasn't essential for our purposes. And that was quite influential for about 10 or 20 years, but, um, but it's been long sort of uh, dismissed. Uh, in, in contemporary analytic philosophy of art, uh, the idea that these emotions that we feel in response to art are of a different kind. Of course, there will be differences, um, but um, it's not even clear that these differences are going to be systematic um, between all of the art uh, cases and all of the non-art cases. They're probably going to be more on a case by case, and even if there were to be find systematic differences between emotions in art and emotions in real life, it wouldn't be the kind of difference in kind uh, that aesthetic emotions, quasi emotions postulate, right? And so I mostly see a continue along with, um, I would say the majority of uh, contemporary assertions, I see more of a continuum uh, between uh, emotion response to fiction Emotion response to art, right? So it's always important to remember not all art is fiction, not all fiction is art, depending on your definition of fiction. And of course, counterfactual reasoning as well, right? So we we routinely, um, you know, um, you know, for example, think about um, dream about the 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 great achievements that we will have um, in uh, in the future, and uh, and we get emotional about them, even though they're not real. So now disgust, uh, as disgust and ugliness have always uh, sort of been seen as extreme cases. I think since Aristotle, who wondered uh, about the case of disgust or ugliness in art, and he said objects which in themselves we view with pain, we delight to contemplate when reproduced with minute fidelity, such as the four most ignoble animals and of dead bodies. So, um, okay, so then is this, so let, let, let's now make a few distinctions between uh, uh, bodily disgust, moral disgust, and ugliness. So first of all, um, bodily and moral disgust. Uh, 
I'm most interested in bodily disgust because it's more neatly uh, uh, discussed. So there's more of an obvious theory uh, in the cognitive science of what bodily disgust is. Moral disgust certainly has some features of uh, bodily disgust, but uh, it's not quite clear yet whether uh, they're the same emotion. And in fact, it's probably not the case that they're uh, the same emotion. So it's it's best to focus on bodily uh, disgust. And so bodily disgust has always been thought uh, or often been taught as the the test, the limit case, right, of negative emotions in art, right? So negative emotions in art are paradoxical. Disgust has seemed to many has the most uh, difficult case, right? So some people uh, in the 18th century were having this debate. Uh, uh, people like Moses Mendelssohn, Lessing, Immanuel Kant, and they were very pessimistic with different degrees of pessimism, but they were quite pessimistic. Um, more recently, people like uh, Noel Carroll and Karen Kosmeyer have been more, much more optimistic in a way that I think is uh, unwarranted. Uh, and so I want to argue three reasons. I want to give three reasons for um, why I think uh, disgust is less, uh, uh, has less potential than other negative emotions in raising in, in uh, giving us aesthetic pleasure or artistic value. By the way, these are this is a classic uh, Rembrandt uh, painting of a carcass of beef, beef. This is a more recent example from uh, installation art from uh, Damien Hirst, just to show the, the amount of disgust that there is in, in art. So one reason is often things that are disgusting, we see them as ugly or contemptible or vile. Now, does that mean that disgust and ugliness are the same thing? Some people have argued even more recently, sort of in a forthcoming, there's a forthcoming paper in Ergo that says that all of the philosophy journal, that says that all of the ugliness, the proper response to ugliness is disgust. I, I, I think that's, that's not true. I think there is a distinction between the two. And so you can think of an ugly building, right? Uh, there's lots of ugly building, but rarely are buildings disgusting, right? And you can argue also that some disgusting things are just um, not ugly, right? So some snails can ha be quite uh, pretty to look at. They can have forms that are pretty to look at, uh, but often they're disgusting. Uh, poisonous mushrooms, I have in mind those really colored ones that you find in, in the north of Italy sometimes and, and elsewhere. Um, if you know what they are, they can be quite disgusting, uh, but um, also quite pretty. So I think that's one problem with uh, disgustingness in art. The second problem is, uh, so this problem was was pointed out um, by by people in the 18th century. Second problem also pointed out by those people is whereas so, so whereas other negative emotions seem to have some sort of uh, positive physiological component to them, right? So say fear has the the adrenaline rush, uh, sadness can be calming. Um, anger can give you that sort of an impulse um, to to uh, seek revenge that that can be pleasurable in in certain circumstances. Disgust seems not to have that kind of um, that kind of uh, admixture of pleasure, um, and also it seems to be, if if that can be said, more unpleasant. Than, than other negative emotions. Now, of course, um, there's, so Korsmaier responds to this charge from the 18th century, so there, there's degrees of disgust. And I, and I agree, there are degrees of disgust, but so are there, so there, so are there uh, degrees of other negative emotions. So overall, disgust is a much more difficult um, beast to, to work with in art. And the last reason why I think it's, is, um, Disgust is is difficult uh, more than other negative emotions. 
is that there's some sense how how much how much time do I still have just to uh, I think uh, a few minutes we have time yes thank you so thank you so so one one reason to be suspicious of disgust is that um, there's a sort of a transparency uh, so, uh, when it comes to disgust. So the, the shield that usually, remember that at the beginning I said that a lot of the time uh, there's this necessary condition that uh, in order for us to enjoy unpleasant enough, is that the emotional event has not to be too overwhelming, right? So a lot of the time you can, the, 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 the idea that something is artistic or that something is fictional Create some distance between the spectator, between the art appreciator and the and the artwork. Uh, but there's an idea that in in disgust this doesn't really uh, happen, right? So there's a sort of a transparency with respect to uh, the real life uh, fiction or real life representation uh, distinction, right? In my own account, so there's been a few accounts over the, the, the decades. My, some, some people have argued that it's because disgust is sensorial. I, I disagree, and the cognitive science of disgust disagrees. I think uh, disgust is primarily ideational. So it's the idea of something it, uh, being what it is that makes it disgusting primarily, not the sensory features that it has. Um, so that can work. Uh, I think that the, the reason why we have this transparency is because um, disgust is often based uh, on objects, whereas other negative emotions are more focused on uh, situations, right? So there's a one-to-one -one correlation between objects of disgust and our response, whereas there is no one-to-one -one correlation between objects of uh, say, fear and our response, right? So a, a knife is not necessarily an object of fear. It can be, it depends on the situation. Whereas an object, regardless of the situation where it is, uh, it tends to be one-to-one -one correlated with disgust. And because lots of art uh, is not situational, right? In a sense, we're not in the, the, the artwork then uh, the immediateness of uh, our reaction of disgust is much greater than in cases of fear. So for instance, imagine you had an artwork like this, right? So you were standing on the top of the Mont Blanc. Um, so this would be a kind of a situational artwork where the response, I would argue, the response of fear would be as immediate as uh, the response that we have uh, of disgust to something like, um, I don't know, this, uh, this work, okay? So and then lastly, how do we find disgusting things uh, pleasurable? Well, so one, so I, I think the higher order response account has um, the most promise uh, in the case of disgust. I also probably think it has the most promise in the case of uh, negative emotions generally, but uh, I'm not too sure about that. So people have talked about this higher order. Well, the higher order response is something that I um, sort of, um, the, the, the term is something that I coined. So in a sense, it's, it's something that I, that's my own concept, but it sort of builds on things that have been said in the past. So for instance, Susan Fagin talks of meta responses or uh, there's a literature on meta emotions. And usually these accounts are dismissed, uh, I think too quickly because they seem to be focusing only on one kind of meta response, right? So meta responses of the kind, the self congratulatory kind, congratulatory kind, right? So we go to the tragedy, we feel good with ourselves because, oh, how compassionate are we to feel um, uh, so and so in, in response to uh, to Othello or something? 
Um, but I think uh, there's potential uh, for the meta response account to sort of, um, you know, talking of higher order responses to, to explain much more, right? So for instance, take this, um, it's my last example, take this uh, Gert Wollheim uh, painting. Um, so Gert Wollheim was in the first war, first world war, and was um, wounded uh, in the stomach and then uh, painted this and um, and and the 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 disgustingness bit here I think uh, works uh, quite well in a number of ways so first of all grabs attention right secondly because it's disgusting increases the idea of the suffering of this man that's supposed to be a soldier uh, in in the first world war and by increasing the idea of suffering increases our compassion uh, towards this uh, uh, this uh, soldier, and then uh, com sort of you have the pleasure of the composition, right? The visual interest and the and the design that gives you some pleasure, and that pleasure is enhanced by the uh, by the compassion, by the vehemence of the compassion that you have, which was in turn enhanced by uh, the disgustingness. So this is one way in which uh, this gives uh, the pleasure here uh, greater than if there wasn't the the disgusting element in it. Uh, that's it. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Philippe, for such an interesting presentation. I'm sure we'll have a lot of comments and questions during the discussion. In the meantime, um, this is the time for our second speaker. Is Valentin Wagner, lecturer in psychology at the Helmut Schmidt University. Dr. Wagner's main research interests involve aesthetics of language and speech, aesthetic of emotions, uh, visual aesthetics, language processing, and language production. He collaborates with the Max Planck Institute for Empirical Aesthetics, and his recent projects include the cognitive and affective implications of elegance, developing an aesthetic emotion scale and investigating links between music and poetry, which I find personally very interesting. Uh, thank you very much for accepting our invitation, Dr. Wagner. We look forward to your talk. Please feel free to share the screen. Yes, hello everybody. Thank you very much, Marina and Nicole for organizing this event and for inviting me to participate as a speaker. I will try to share my screen. Great, thank you. Okay, so um, for this seminar, this is disgusting art as it's challenging medium. I will focus in my talk um, as on the question how to explain the enjoyment of negative emotion in art reception. And for me, the talk by Filippo was quite interesting to see that there are so many similarities between the philosophical accounts on how to answer this question or to the different aspects we have to, to tangle if we want to answer this question and what we in psychology um, bring together for that. So I will start with a few examples of negative emotional response we can have to works of art. So we can be affronted um, because the artwork is um, insulting me in my own beliefs and values, which I feel that are violated. Um, an example would be this artwork by Serrano, his Christ. But we can also be frustrated because one do not understand the meaning or the message of an artwork, what the artist wanted to convey. Um, it depends in a few cases on the expertise you have in the expected um, type of art. Or you can be angry about a pure execution of a play. And maybe not the best example, but Plan 9 from Outer Space is sometimes called the yeah, most terrible movie ever um, generated, produced. And you can also be being disgusted by the display of disgusting matters, um, as an example here, photographed by Cindy Sherman. And we can be saddened when we hear, listen to mournful songs. 
and also be anxious for the protagonist of a narrative of a novel we read. And there are many more examples you can think about. And I think what we can do is to, to group or differentiate between these negative emotional responses in several ways. And there are two distinctions I want to, um, to point out. So on one side, we can um, group some examples into emotion which are related to the artwork as an object or to the artist. And the example would be to be being fascinated by the ex execution of a performance um, by an actor. And on the other side, the emotion could be related to the content or to the message of the artwork. When I feel moved by the fate of a character in a novel, and this distinction in a quite similar way was brought up by Ed Tan uh, in an article in 1990, uh, 1994, where he called it a emotion for artifact emotion when it's related to the artwork as an object and F emotion when it's related to the fictional content of the artwork. A second distinction somehow related to the first one is that on one side, we can say when we experience negative emotion to an artwork um, that is that are emotion that we anticipated and even sought by um, when going to the cinema, looking at a horror movie and feeling aroused and thrilled. And on the other side, it also happens then um, we will have an unexpected, usually or rather avoided emotional response um, when we go to a dance performance. Uh, or poetry slam and feel bored by a dull performance. And well, to step back, um, topic also brought up by Filippo was whether when we experience negative emotion in art reception of this, whether this kind of emotion are um, real, genuine, emotion and this question was and is still hotly debated in philosophy and the prominent position um, is that yes emotional responses in art reception are no real emotion but as if or quasi or make-believe emotion yet no genuine emotion and also in psychology there are a few people scientists who deny that we experience genuine negative emotion in response to works of arts one of them is Kunechny, uh, who has a title and a commentary to our um, distancing and embracing model I will um, introduce in a few seconds, where he wrote negative emotion live in stories, not in the hearts of the readers um, who enjoy them. Well, Yes, there are differences between emotion we experience in our everyday life, in the real life, and those we have in response to artworks, especially regarding the F type, the F emotion type. And these emotion in response to artworks in the psychological literature, they are often called also vicarious or sympathetic emotion. And um, I think Klaus Scherer, he proposed the designation commotion to single them out as a special type of emotion, but nevertheless as a as real emotion, as genuine emotion. And a further point, how in psychology we look at these types of emotion is that I think there's a tactic, a tacit assumption in most or many psychological studies um, on emotion. Um, which uses more often than less artistic stimuli like film clips out of feature films, photographs, music, songs to elicit, to induce emotion in their participants. And there is mostly no discussion whether there are differences between emotion aroused or induced by such stimuli and the emotion we encounter in our everyday life. So there are different um, there are differences in how well different emotion can be evoked by those means, and maybe we will 
come to this or return to this topic later on in the discussion. So the next question before coming to our model is why negative emotion at all? And a few hundred years ago, but two French philosopher wrote also about uh, yeah, the paradox of tragedy. And this is a quote from him that artists succeed much more easily with unpleasant objects in the arts than with the pleasant ones. And uh, yes, Filippo brought up a similar point. I think um, when looking or in the humanities, in the discussion, discourses in humanities regarding the different types of artworks, we can say that artworks compete for attention, for access to memory, and for intense emotional involvement. And in the psychology of emotion, we can say that there's overwhelming evidence that negative emotion prioritize attention, are less prone to wear out, are better accessible to memory than positive emotion. Um, Baumeister and colleagues, they coined this phrase to bring it to the point that bad is stronger than good in this regard. And taking these both points together, we can conclude this negative emotion are a predestined resource for the arts efforts rather than only be a paradox paradoxical license in special cases. So not only in regard to the so-called paradox of tragedy, um, we encounter negative emotion in art reception, but um, many, many, um, much more often. And well, the four answers Filippo brought up, uh, the first answer is also here in my slide, uh, purely, purely pleasant presentation of beautiful objects or events, uh, possibly prone to boredom and lacking in emotional involvement. And yes, we don't, not really know uh, of a single drama or novel where only a long lasting happy marriage is, is depicted, but mostly fairy tales, happy romances, comedies devote far more time and space um, to conflict and to negative feelings before they come to the happy ending. And again, in um, studies on narratives from several different cultures, um, scholars come to the conclusion that social conflict is the key subject in most narrative arts and even for the non-representational arts like music um, to have a major aesthetic trajectory, we rely on tension and um, the up and downs and negative effect. So therefore um, we can say emotion play a very important part that arts can fulfill um, therefore they are invented by the artists and to answer the question how to explain the enjoyment of negative emotion in art rece reception Winfried Manninghaus um, and Julian Harnig, Eugen Wasilewitzki, Thomas Jakobsen, Stefan Kölsch and myself we we published this model, the distancing embracing model of the enjoyment of negative emotion in art perception. And I will um, I will give you a few insights into the empirical backing regarding this model. So in general, we distinguish between two types of factors with, which play an essential role that we can enjoy negative emotion in arts. So the first factor is the distancing factor, we called it, um, where we have different types of situational schemata, the art schema, the representation schema, the fiction schema, which um, may all come into play or just one. And also in the talk before, Filippo made some remarks that we art is not equal to fiction and vice versa. Nevertheless, very often we have um, artworks where we know it is art, the artworks represent something and that was a rep 
what they represent is fictional. So it can be that all three schemas are activated. And these schemas, they lay the ground that the other factors or the other components of our model, which we have included in the embracing factor, can come into play and um, help to in, um, include negative emotion in the experience of negative emotion into the overall pleasurable experiences of arts. And beginning with um, the distancing factor, I will present you two short studies on the art schema. So the art schema is a situation concept of art reception and it it entails that the recipients are safe, or at least that they feel safe and that they have the control or the feeling that they have the control over the situation, which means that they have the capacity to seek um, the experience, to discontinue the experience, to end the exposure at will. And furthermore, and this is the difference to the representation schema, is that the art schema also entails um, that we'll, we look with higher intention to details and focus more on aesthetically appealing features. And in the same regard, when we are in an art reception situation, we also have an expectation that the art experience, the watching of the movie in the cinema or the listening to the music in the concert, the reading of the novel, that these experiences will overall be pleasurable. That's yeah, the most mainly reason that we will seek these experiences out. So in our first study, we use disgusting images to test um, whether we can show that there is something like an art schema effect. And we presented pictures either in an art framing or in a reality framing. Um, we used cover stories either telling the participants that the picture were recently exhibited in a modern art museum or that the pictures they will see um, were for a website on hygiene education. And we also presented cover story related questionnaire either about art experiences or uh, about their behavior regarding hygiene and used also props in the lab. So when participants entered the room, the lab room, there were either books um, regarding artists and artworks or there were utensils for hygiene, for cleaning and something like that. All in all, we tested 32 students and they were tested in a between participant design that is either they were in the art framing or in the reality framing. And they had to rate how positive, how negative and how intense their feeling were regarding the pictures. And in the second, um, and they saw the pictures a second time and had to tell how beautiful the picture were or how disgusting the depicted objects um, were. And the pretest ensured that the stimuli could be equally well presented as artworks or as documentary photographs. And so initially we also started with real artworks like this self-portrait shit by Andreno uh, by Andres Serrano. But the pretest um, showed that this picture is not suitable to go as a documentary photograph for hygiene instruction. So we dismissed it, excluded it and used picture like these ones. The pictures on the left in the left column were pictures which were rated quite beautiful in the pretest, and the pictures in the right column were pictures who had the highest scores regarding disgustingness. And here you also see the results. The most important one is that regarding the positive feelings people have when sawing or looking at the pictures, we see a significant difference regarding the art frame group and the hygiene frame group with people in the art condition having higher feelings of positive effect as compared to the hygiene group. Uh, one more interesting point is that on the other side, there is no difference regarding the negative feeling people have in regard in response to these stimuli. And 
a second point is that uh, nevertheless we see a positive effect of the art schema regarding um, the increase of positive effect nevertheless in this situation the negative effect is still much greater than the positive effect even for the people in the art schema group so a second study um, we conducted we go uh, we wanted to test two more things so usually when you invite participant into the lab to um, participate in an experiment they know as the overall framing situation schema this is an experiment i am participant in a psychological study and in this frame i will assume now that i will look at art pictures or hygiene pictures and to circumvent this we went into the field and conducted a field study where the participants at the moment where they participated in our study didn't know that they participated in a psychological study the second aim was that we wanted to try whether anger is an emotion which also can be enjoyed in specific circumstances of art reception and therefore we worked together with a professional theater group and invented a theater performance um, of an experimental testing situation we use therefore typical procedures which are used in psychological anger studies and the situation was a one-to-one -one situation of performer and participant and the performer said the actors were blind with respect to the experimental manipulation so they didn't know whether the participant in front of them was a participant in the reality framing or in the art framing and again we had these two framings the art framing was that this theater performance was um, announced in an real contemporary theater festival which is um, every year in Berlin the 100, 100 Grad Festival and for the reality framing we invented a personal assessment firm or a personal recruitment firm Ominura which was um, looking for people persons who would participate in their examination of a new cognitive aptitude test and um, yeah our hypothesis was that on one side with people in the art framing would show higher rating for positive emotion as well as lower ratings for felt anger and also show lower diastolic blood pressure which is a physiological measure indicating arousal and in this far also anger and this is the design is the procedure of um, the study we have as i told you two types of recruitment with also um, what's the type of framing the participants were experiencing then participants of both groups come together in a reception room and we also had a second room to make sure that the performers the actors who were performing the aptitude test do not know whether the participant had received an art framing um, is a theater goer or whether the participant is a volunteer for test ev evaluation and we co collected several um, self-reports during the course of the experiment and also physiological measures and in the end we had the debriefing and finally collected measures again and the essential results are here self-report um, using the self-assessment mannequin scale you see on the left side of the figures um, in the bottom and in the top um, icons representing pleasure or unpleasantness um, and you see that for the participants in the reality group there is uh, much stronger decrease in pleasure as compared to the people in the art framing group regarding arousal we see that both have an increase in arousal but again a stronger arousal 
increase for the reality group. And finally, the dominance measure, there is the opposite effect that people in the art framing group, they feel during the course of the experiment, um, yeah, there is an increase in their dominance feeling, whereas for the participants in the reality group, there is a decrease. And this effect nicely reflects that um, the part of the art schema that you are in the art reception usually in control that you can at every time point say, OK, it's enough. I will stand up and go out because I don't like the performance. Um, here's some more results. In the debriefing, we also pa asked participants how they felt, how intense they felt, um, several type of emotion. And here you see differences between the reality and the art framing with higher ang um, anger and disgust scores for the reality framing, whereas the enjoyment and the interestingness scores were higher for the theater goer in the art framing. I think I skip this into the time. And I will present one more study on um, a process regarding the embracing factor, uh, the aesthetic virtues of the artistic representation. And again, Filippo also already pointed out to um, this issue, Aristotle, Quote regarding the horrible pictures and tragic memories that the painterly representation of disgusting animal corpses can be can nevertheless be inherently inherently masterful and admirable, and also regarding tragedy that the great suffering which constitutes the plot of tragedy goes along with an often marked sweetness of harmony, melody, meter in the language of tragedy. And the question is whether these artistic virtues help to compensate the negative emotion elicited by the artworks. And the study um, I present therefore is a study on moving poems. We had 20 sadly and 20 joyfully moving poems in two versions. The two versions were the original version of the poem and the experimental manipulated version where we eliminated several parallelistic features like the meter of the sentence, the rhyme, and further features like alliteration and effervous repetitions. We had in the study 80 participants, each one rated four poems in two versions regarding different or several aesthetic appreciations, scales, uh, liking of the poem, the beautiness, the melodiousness and regarding their, their emotional responses when listening to the poems, how much they felt being moved, how much they felt sadness, felt joy and the intensity of their overall emotional responses. Uh, a short example for the type of the experimental modification. So originally we used German poems, but here's four lines of a poem by William Blake. And the difference is that we took out the rhyme and destroyed the meter of the of the lines. So when you read um, the poems by yourself, you will see that the modified version there is no this yeah, rhythmic metered flow of the of the words uh, as compared to the original one. And the results, I again only will highlight the most important one for our question is that for the sadly moving poems, we found a significant difference regarding the felt sadness that the original poems um, elicited a higher response in felt sadness as compared to the modified poems. On the same side, they also were rated having in, induced a higher positive effect as compared to the modified um, poems. So that the conclusion is that the aesthetic virtues, so in this case, the pluralistic um, feature of the language enhances 
also the negative emotional response to the poem. Yet nevertheless, also the positive ratings go up and also the aesthetic appreciation ratings like liking beauty and so forth. And uh, our conclusion is that the aesthetic virtues self help to intensify the emotional responses, even in the negative case, and the positive effect of negative emotions is the intensity they bring about. Um, do I have a few more minutes? Um, yeah, go ahead. OK, so for last study on the um, aspect of mixed emotion as mediators of negative emotion, I will present you very shortly the last study where we used film clips, why we like to watch sad films, the pleasures of being moved in aesthetic experiences. We had 76 participants watch or look at 38 film clips from various genres, um, melodramatic films, but also um, thrillers, um, adventurous genres and things like that, um, depicting a death news scenario. So in every film clip, a person, the main protagonist, um, report the news that a uh, near person, the husband, the children, a beloved friend was killed or uh, died. And we presented these clips with pre-recorded synopsis so that they were understandable um, the situation for the participants and the participants rated their feelings entirely. Uh, we asked for sadness, being moved, and how much they wanted to see the whole film due to the short clip they saw. And we used this as a proxy for liking because in a um, pilot study to this one, we, we asked for liking and had there also an effect, but um, this was diminished. And um, the in the debriefing of the studies, some participants told us that it's strange to answer how much they liked um, these death news scenarios. And therefore we changed um, to ask as a proxy for liking how much people wanted to see the whole um, feature film. And we have several hypotheses. So the first one that there's a positive correlation between felt sadness and wanted to see the film as a proxy for liking. And um, this is what we found. There is a positive correlation. The second hypothesis what that being moved, the feeling state of being moved mediates the effect of felt sadness of uh, on wanted to see. That is the more sadness views experiences the more moved they feel and the more moved they feel the more they will enjoy the clip and again um, this caveat was also brought up by Filippo just up to a certain point and regarding this hypothesis um, we computed um, mediation analysis so we see a positive correlation between felt sadness and being moved and also um, being moved is positively correlated to uh, the variable one to see. And when we have been moved in this regression analysis, the association between felt sadness and one to see is reduced to zero. And this means that the effect of felt sadness on the, our liking proxy is completely mediated by this emotional state of being moved. And we have um, replicated this effect in two more data sets um, and this I will skip again. So uh, the important point is that while the um, distancing factor gives us the space that we can experience negative emotion without being harmed by the negativity of these emotions, um, they lay the ground that the mechanisms or processes of the embracing factor make use of the negative emotion to increase the overall enjoyment we have in 
um, art reception. So this is my talk regarding the question, how do we explain the enjoyment of negative emotion? Many thanks for your attention and I want to give many thanks also to all my colleagues involved in this endeavor. Winfried Menninghaus, Thomas Jakobsen, Julian Harnich, Eugen Wasilewitzki, Ine Schindler, Christine Knob, Stefan Kölsch, Julian Klein and Mira Schaar. And there were many, many more people bringing about all these studies. Many thanks also to them. Okay, I will stop the Thank sharing. You Thank you. That was great, really. I enjoyed it a lot. Um, so it's time for us to start the discussion, and we typically begin the discussion asking our speakers to comment on each other talks. So, Philippa, do you want to begin? Uh, yeah, thanks. Okay, that's that's difficult because uh, I enjoyed I enjoyed this. Maybe a couple of points uh, quickly. I would like to have more. Um, I don't know clarification on what, what Valentin thinks about um, these. One one is the the general status of the distancing and praising emotion, right? So uh, so for instance, the the <clears throat> you know my higher order response uh, account and, and others, uh, you know the conventional account in Hume, uh, lots of other um, um, accounts in philosophy. They they sort of give um, well, uh, in many cases, they attempt to give a sort of a mechanism of why you have the the emotion, uh, the unpleasant emotion, then sort of the somehow the pleasure, right, or or the positive value. Uh, whereas the distancing, embracing emotion, uh, uh, sorry, uh, account seems to be rather than a mechanistic um, account, more of a um, a sort of a now, a sort of um, an a labeling uh, of the two uh, st stages, right? Uh, and then, at, you know, below this uh, this labeling, you have some mechanistic accounts, mm -hmm. right? So it's not it's not a mechanistic account itself, and and so that's my impression. Want to know if that's uh, the right impression or, or whether um, you think I'm I'm wrong? The other issue is, uh, again, is an issue of status. Uh, I've heard lots of people uh, talk recently about being moved. Even some philosophers and uh, people in Geneva um, have been postulating this different emotion of being moved. That has always struck me as quite, um, um, I don't know, puzzling, because it's just not a type of emotion that, that I would normally um, consider. And so I, I wonder whether you, you uh, folks are taking being moved as a sort of a, an emotion in itself, or whether you think it's a sort of a type of component, uh, physiological component maybe, of a bunch of different uh, emotions, including sadness, uh, but also others. Okay, yeah. I will start to answer the first question first. So I, I would also say the titling, distancing and embracing. So these are really titles and not by themselves um, processes or mechanisms. So we are grouping different mechanisms um, we see which are at work when we enjoy negative emotion in art reception. And one important difference is between these both is that uh, the distancing factor uh, is in place even before we start um, seeing the movie. So when we decide to go to the movie and then we are in the movie, we know, okay, we are in the movie and uh, it's ongoing that we, so not always in the present of our consciousness, but in the background, of our experiences, we know we're in the movie, we're watching a film. And I think many of um, this what we bring together in the distancing embracing model is not really new. So there are many of these um, ideas have been discussed in philosophy and also in psychology. And I would also say um, 
the idea you brought up, um, the meta response um, solution. So I would share the critique you have regarding that uh, it's when we only think of meta response, it's of the self congratulation um, type. I feel sad for those people. Oh, how a beautiful person I am. Um, that's just then I think you answered in this regard, then go to the uh, hospital and have your fun. So, it, but there could be other types of meta response. And um, I think somehow related to what you bring for with the meta response ideas, um, that we sometimes want to feel alive in a certain way and experiencing emotion and even negative ones show us that we are alive. And this is a mechanism I would say we didn't have at the moment in our distancing embracing model, but which would be then part of the embracing part of the of the model. Yes, so far for the first question and regarding the second regarding being moved uh, I think it's an emotion like other emotion it's not maybe a, an easy um, a simple emotion like fear or sadness it's probably of a more complex type but also I would say emotion like shame or guilt are not as simple or basic as sadness and fear and anger. And um, being moved, so for the English language there's a problem, you don't have a noun for this emotion. Maybe poignancy is going in this direction, but I think it's just a sub type of being moved. Whereas in many other languages you have nouns for this emotion. So in Germany it's um, uh, it would be Rührung. Rührung, um, we have it translated in some publication as being stirred. And um, what we are thinking is that there are two different types, the sad, sadly moving type and the um, joyfully moving type, but that what is essential is in 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 experiencing of being moved you have also negative as well as positive um parts in the in the experiences um well and at the moment i think in psychology there is a few research group who are looking at being moved and there are different accounts so there's one group which would deny that there is always a negative part and which want to just focus on the positive part and would say that what we see as negative part of being moved is just sadness. But I think there is a distinction between feeling sad and feeling moved. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Um, is that it or do you want to continue? No, I... I okay, yes, thank you both very much. Um, I just want to remind everyone that if you have a question, you should raise your hand or just write your question in the chat. Um, so I myself also have questions, but I can see that Patrick raised his hand. Patrick, do you want to ask your question, please? Uh, sure, thank you. Thank you very, uh, very much for uh, two really interesting talks today. Um, <clears throat> my question is about the nature of disgust or the disgusting. And I recall at one point, Filippo, you, you said that you preferred a sort of ideational model to a sort of sensorial model. And in both talks, there was an emphasis on sort of visual or even sort of narrative examples. But perhaps um, at least in a sort of folk sense, what does disgust primarily is connected to is the senses of, of taste and touch and smell, you know, noxious smells and things that can poison us and, um, you know, slimy surfaces and, and this sort of thing. And in the more continental tradition, there's a lot of emphasis on um, the body and its permeability and um, 
disgust being a mechanism by which we, we're sort of confronted with our own animality, our mortality, things like that. And these are just sort of aspects of disgust that I, I didn't see being sort of foregrounded. And I wondered whether there was a reason for it. And one, one side note is that it seems like this kind of disgust reaction concerns the, the organic. Um, and it seems like the artist, the role of the artist is primarily, although not without exception, um, to work with the inorganic. Um, and I, I wonder if art is sort of, the disgust response in art is one removed from this more biological bodily reactivity that, that we sometimes know as disgust. Thank you. So I guess that that was um, um, for me to, at least partially. So the um, okay. So there's two things I guess that you said. One is the latter. I agree um, that there is that uh, twice removed um, aspect because it is it is true that bodily disgust is um, primarily elicited by organic material. Um, and so a lot of art is uh, doesn't deal with uh, sort of the material itself isn't organic. Uh, having said that, you know there there's installation art. Um, so so in for example the Damien Hirst sculpture uh, sorry installation that I that I showed that the the head of the cow or the animal is is in there right. So it's it's actually part of the composition. There's also another one that I didn't show you in which is just it's just a, it's by a British um, alter uh, painter called uh, Briggs, Briggs, Brisley, Stuart Brisley. It's just a canvas uh, smeared with feces, right? So that's part of the. Uh, oh, piss of the Christ! I, I believe Valentin's example. Oh, those actually feature human urine, right? Is, is piss it, Christ yeah. is a photograph, though. So, um, so oh. then, so it's not part okay. of the artwork itself, and then you have to also. I mean, you have to take Andres Serrano's word that that was um, his actual piss. And anyway, so that, but that, yeah. So, so a lot of the time you you don't have that, and so that helps uh, uh, remove um, the spec the appreciator from 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 the work. The the other things that I I I am aware that the continental tradition focuses a bit more. I didn't talk about, for example, uh, a philosopher called Carol. Talon Yugon, who was one of the very first, well, very early, early person to talk uh, about disgust in, in philosophy in contemporary times. And, and she has a very sensory view, sensorial view uh, of disgust. Um, I, um, I like uh, to follow the cognitive science in distinguishing between disgust and distaste. Uh, and so relegating all of the, the things that we sometimes in ordinary language do call disgust, you're right, uh, to the distaste. But um, uh, it doesn't uh, neatly uh, fit into the, the, the ordinary uh, um, sen the, the sense, the meaning of the ordinary word disgust. But then I think disgust is such a big it's a bit like beauty. It's such a polysemous word in the ordinary language that, I mean, for example, there were, you know, so there's the state, there's uh, actual body disgust, there's moral disgust. There were things uh, uh, such as some of the things that Valentin uh, had at the beginning, things like you find some painting or some indeed philosopher or colleagues so like their, his word, their work is just so bad that you say, oh, it's disgusting, but obviously you don't mean in any of these senses, you don't mean morally, you don't mean uh, sensorially, you don't mean um, actually bodily disgusting, right? So there's so much that we say with the word disgust that I don't think it's um, too much of a, a a problem to distinguish between distaste and disgust and analyze the two the two phenomena separately. Does that answer? Is am I missing something or? Uh, no, I don't think so. Other other than to say perhaps that this notion of distaste also could be construed as aesthetically significant sure. um, as well, and that artists can perhaps employ or deploy uh, 
objects that can create that kind of uh, response. I, yeah. I completely agree, and there, and there needs to be more study of the distaste. Even the ugly is very little study in, in contemporary uh, philosophical aesthetics. There's so much uh, to do, yeah. Great, thank you for the question and for the answer. Um, we have a question from Nicole. Nicole, do you want to ask your question, please? Thank you, Marina. Thank you both our speakers uh, for such interesting presentations. Um, I think rather than a real question, I wanted to ask Filippo um, to expand on a concept that you introduced in uh, um, in your presentation. Um, if I understood correctly, you said that this guest belongs more on the realm of ideas uh, rather than the bodily realm. I, did I understand correctly? And if so, yeah, I'd like to ask you to expand on this. Not, not exactly. I, th I think it is bodily, but it is, as I was saying to Patrick earlier, and, and uh, sort of more ideation, more, more uh, solicited primarily for ideational reasons rather than for sensory reasons. So, so for example, I mean, the classic, um, I had this in my presentation, then didn't have time. So, the things that I have in mind are, um, so Angel was one of the very early sort of, I guess you can call them psychologists, but it was in the 1940s. So it was sort of, a, I don't know, philosopher, psychologist uh, to study this guest. And he had this example of um, this uh, older of, uh, uh, this older that was uh, quite um, um, sort of unpleasant to him uh, uh, initially. And then and it, because it kind of resembled uh, some sort of a dead animal, right? And it was walking in the in the countryside and sort of uh, smelled this um, uh, odor and was repulsed by it. And then sort of got closer to the source of the of the smell and realized it was actually a, a glue uh, factory, or you know, sort of, or, you know, sort of was glue and uh, sort of immediately changed this uh, uh, response from one of disgust to one of actually pleasure because, uh, you know, for some, you know, he had personal uh, reasons, uh, um, uh, sort of biographical reasons why, uh, you know, he grew up uh, with uh, someone, I can't remember, someone, uh, you know, using glue all the time, stuff like that, right? More recently, uh, they've done actual experiments. Um, Rosen was the first uh, psychologist to suggest this, and then it was actually experimented by Rachel Hertz and, and probably others, um, sort of asking subjects, participants to smell uh, a vial containing the same substance and, uh, and the labeling one vomit and the other cheese changed dramatically the emotional response uh, that people were, were having. Um, so in that sense, um, I, I say that it's primarily ideational rather than about the taste, whereas things like, I don't know, say broccoli, a lot of people are sort of quote unquote disgusted by, say, the texture of broccoli, right? But that is just a that is just a, a taste um, issue, right? So in that case, I would call it the taste, right? So one one the the one easy way to distinguish between disgust and distaste, um, you know, uh, other than one is ideation and the other is sensory, is the notion of contamination, right? So if you're eating broccoli in a, you know, if someone gives you broccoli with steak, you don't, you, you have a distaste for broccoli, you just put the broccoli aside and go ahead and eat the, st the steak and it doesn't matter that much to you. If you present it with feces and a steak, you don't just put aside the, the feces, right? Because the feces have contaminated uh, the whole uh, plate. Um, yeah. So, does that help? Is that what you wanted to? Yeah, yeah, it helps. And I think it feel it feels to me that your the way you contextualize this uh, it kind of links with Valentin's presentation when he, he talks about the art schema and the framing uh, effect that perhaps a yeah, I think perhaps that's the link that, that I see from more experimental point of view. So, yeah, thank you very much. I know Marina also has a question. Yes, thank you all. Um, I really enjoyed today's both talks. I just wanted to say that 
this issue whether emotions we experience in art and in fiction are similar or not to emotions we experience in everyday life has been investigated for a really long time in psychology and what I didn't like about these studies is that they typically just compared the intensity of negative emotions people experience in both cases. But in, in the experiments which Valentin presented today and what Filippo talked today, I thought that it's much more important not just to compare the intensity of emotions to answer that question, but to understand the mechanisms which underlie say, for example, how we regulate our negative emotions. Maybe we regulate them differently in art versus in everyday life. For example, because in art, we don't have to act immediately when we engage with negative content. Um, just in, the, in, in, in Valentin's model, he presented there was, for example, a um, component which was called meaning making. And I was just wondering whether do you think we can make, we can perceive negative content, maybe disgusting content differently when we think that this is art. Say in that experiment you made when you showed disgusting photographs and in one case you said that this is like um, presented them in art context and then in everyday everyday life context I just wonder whether I mean experiments like this or a bit similar to this were conducted before for example with wine when people drink wine and they are told that this is an extremely expensive and very elite wine and this is when they drink the same wine, but they are told that this is a very cheap wine from a supermarket and people indeed report different levels of pleasure. So this is like the frame effect, the effect of context. But I was also wondering whether this is not the whole story behind your experiment and whether people indeed make meaning differently from this disgusting content being in two different contexts in art versus everyday life. So I just wonder if this component in your model reflects the idea. Just I remember being in a contemporary museum and seeing a video art of um, how do they call them? Um, grass snakes, which some people, you know, there are farms with grass snakes because some people eat them. And they just in this video art, they just showed a huge amount of these grass snakes just moving around and that was definitely disgusting but it was accompanied by music and I saw it in a museum so I started immediately making different meanings like oh this is like a metaphor of modern society how we all are like how say how overcrowded it is and how people are always in un live under pressure and stuff like that I wonder if I would make the same meaning out of this video if I just saw it as a, an example of a grass snake farm, you know, actually. Um, so yeah, that, that's mainly my question and comment. Thank you. Um, okay, so yeah. I think, I think Valentin, do you want to go first? Uh, yeah. yeah, I think it's a, it's a great um, comment or an important point. Um, that in art, art is produced by or made by artists and is therefore in social interaction, it's communication. So an art object always poses us the question, what, what does it say to us or what wants the artist to say with the artwork to us? Probably or mostly we won't have a definite final answer to this question, but um, the question is there. And whereas when yeah, just visiting the uh, the farm and seeing all these grass insects uh, whirling around would be beautiful or disgusting, but there is no uh, intention from another person I want to to um, yeah, to understand and this is in a certain way related to meaning making so in but in 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 the model we were more thinking or trying to um, include explanation which were brought forward by Mary Beth Oliver Anne Bartsch in um, the type of film studies film psychology of films where they um, had the idea taking up the different uh, distinction between, um, yeah, also from philosophy of the Greeks, um, the distinction between a hedonic orientation in life and an eudynamic orientation 
whether you want to yeah how to to make a, to live quietly and that the eudynamic approach um helps to yeah to, to grow your human potential helps to to get answers to the question how to do the, to to uh, to live the right way and that in this regard narratives of tragedy helps us to remind us what is really valuable and things like that and um i think this relates also what you brought also up um filippo that art is very often about the human condition and uh, we have negative and positive sides up and downs and so the meaning making helps us to yeah to get better forward with our own life and this is a positive we take out of the negative experience of looking or reading the tragedy so this was um the first part where we were thinking about how to include this in the model but the example you brought up i think it's also a good example because art has to do with communication with intention thank you very much i very often say that about art and communication but some people make fun of me because art is not like real online communication but i very much empathize with that idea <laughs> Yeah, and um, I'll, I'll just jump in the conversation just to make a remark that perhaps uh, uh, this is a controversial statement because uh, that would be, um, well, we do recognize and call artworks certain artifacts that have been created, not necessarily with the intention of communicating something, or perhaps uh, uh, there are artworks that the artist himself did create without the intention of sharing it. So perhaps the, I, I'm, I I, I do like and empathize with the idea of uh, um, framing art as communication. However, I do see the potential issues with this, um, with this question, with this, uh, with this framing. So, yeah, I don't know. Um, I guess this is a, uh, an open question, perhaps <laughs> now, uh, because we run out of time. Uh, but. Uh, yeah, I'd just like to uh, put it there. So um, I'd like to thank very much our speakers uh, again uh, and uh, everyone who tuned in to, to join us today. And I'll just remind that next week we'll talk about AI uh, and art. So I'm going to stop the recording now.